the first session, which is Metamorphosis and the, the Modern, and to welcome our first speaker, Jim Coddington, at, currently at the Institute of Fine Arts in NYU. Jim is a man who really needs no introduction in New York, but I'd like to give you a brief overview of his career. He's a conservator who has recently retired from the Museum of Modern Art as the Agnes Gund Chief Conservator. In addition to his restoration of paintings, he is focused on topics including structural restoration of paintings, development of accurate color documentation in art, automated texture identification of photo papers, multispectral analysis of paintings, and the use of flash thermography for the study of paintings. He has also published on the theory and practice of conservation, as well as studies of Pollock, de Kooning, Miro, Cezanne, and Pissarro. And the title of his presentation is, As a Matter of Fact, Art. Please join me in welcoming Jim. Thanks, Jen. Um, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Bard, uh, for inviting me to be part of what is um, a really uh, provocative and um, I'm finding um, a very exciting series of symposia. Active matter. Um, let's start. Well, let's do start. <laughs> Um, this one here? Yeah, the Ford one got <laughs> worn out. <laughs> Can I do it from here? Yeah, there we go. Active matter. I think we're going to have a lot of fun the next couple of days if this is what we're talking about. That was a clip from Peter Fishley and David Weiss's The Way Things Go, recorded on 16 millimeter video in 1987. The Way Things Go is a riot of pyrotechnics, anticipation, potential energy turned into kinetic energy, or more to the point, fun. This work is full of themes that contemporary art engages, sliding back and forth between allusions to sex, violent ends, maintaining a most delicate balance between order and chaos, all the while infusing the video with a subversive humor that ranges from unseemly sounds of gas escaping and water dribbling to the irony of Swiss artists carefully constructing destruction, defying their national image of lasting quality, and yet so carefully building each of these devices like little Swiss, Swiss watches, and on and on. They pay homage to some of the great masters of modern art, Hitchcock's mastery of suspense, Duchamp's own sly humor, <clears throat> Pollock's controlled splatters and drive to make energy visible, Rauschenberg's tire stuffed with an Angora goat, Smithson's asphalt rundown, and Sarah's prop pieces that carry with them their own suspense and suspensions. It offers us a meditation on the history of art in a most companionable way. And yet we find ourselves asking a particular art historical question, one we might ask of a venerated old master like Van Eyck, Vermeer, or Velazquez, how did they do that? 
In a sense, while we can think extensively on, how, on, on what and how this film thinks about art, it also asks us to think about how art is made and what happens in the studio avant le lettre. This is, of course, a question that is a common source of joint inquiry for conservators, conservation scientists, and art historians. In regards to this video, it is not difficult, though, to think of a process that would cobble together a selection of the everyday materials they used and that would then be arranged to interact. You take what you have, or the objects you have chosen, and see how they work together. As I try to construct how the way things go might have been pieced together by first describing what I see, I am struck by how nouns and verbs mirror each other throughout. Balloons balloon. Flames flame. Matter is another matter. Such vagueness of the use of language hints at a capaciousness of possible outcomes and a randomness in the development of these events, even if the outcome is carefully tested and the film carefully edited. We are thinking in each instance of our reconstruction about the different agents, chance, choice, and change, that activate matter in art. These agents are of interest to us in how they are read within the artworks, the matter that changes, and through artists, whose choices are often complex mixtures combustions even, of chance and change within and between matter. This talk will focus at first on distinguishing these different agents within works, but will do so poorly because it is a far richer and complicated question to answer even in far more time than allotted here. However, I will try to make some useful distinctions of historical context in an effort to raise more questions of how interpretive strategies influence such distinctions. Come on. You don't want to do that. There. The specific, specific cases I will discuss will be paintings and how one might read the role of chance, choice, and change in them. The practice of painting has invited theorization for many centuries. These theories ranging from the prescriptive to efforts to advance the status of painting by the very presence of a theory. Uh, and this uh, slide you're seeing is equestrian portrait of uh, Philip IV from the uh, Prado. So, these theories ranging from the prescriptive to efforts to advance the status of painting by the very presence of a theory. The chance event, the accidental or even seemingly accidental event in a painting can present a problem to coherent theorization of painting as it has no articulated premise for being. That said, a theory of any sort is likely to have trouble with the random and unexpected, even in a probabilistic universe. We don't lay odds on whether the act of painting is the act of painting. We instead theorize it. Gridley McKim Smith, Greta Anderson, and Richard Newman explored the question of the accidental in Spanish painting in their outstanding book, Examining Velazquez. It is not only one of the very first truly collaborative ventures of art history, technical art history, and science, it is one of the best, a paradigm. At one point, they discussed the evolution of the Barone in Spanish painting. The Barone, and this is a detail of the painting you just saw, the Barone being a rough mark on the canvas, barely, if any different, from an accidental blot, and therefore a mark that reflected a crudeness of intellect and purpose on the part of the artist. These authors traced the change in perception of the Barone from accident to artifice in Spanish writers of the 17th century. The Spanish theorists sought to account not only for the pervasive presence of slashing marks that mimic the Barone, but to also align such painting with the perceived greatness of Venetian painting, and specifically Titian, whose late work famously dissolved into such abbreviated brushwork. McKim Smith et al. write, quote, to sum up the history of the reception of Barones in Spain, originally connoting condemnation, the Barone underwent a decided change in meaning between the late 16th and early 17th centuries. The good Barone was no longer provisional or accidental. Spaniards, with their concern that their pictures meet cr traditional criteria for fine art, ultimately legitimized the new brushwork by means of old standards." Unquote. Critical reassessment is thus one way an accident, or even crudeness, finds a life. It is theorized into something else. But this happens, in this case at least, because it keeps showing up in the art and thus needs explanation. The key thing is that what was once viewed as chance is now a choice by the artist, both in the present and retrospectively. Let's move on to change and how theories or interpretive approaches might account for that. In France, the painting methods of Watteau were also found to be wanting in some ways. They were lamented during his lifetime and after for their lack of polish and durability. 
Oliver Wunsch, in a recent article in the Art Bulletin, argues that in Watteau, a crack, a change, while not specifically intended, may well have been expected and thus might be a re repository of meaning or historical value. That his paintings changed rapidly, discoloration and cracking being noted in his lifetime and for years thereafter, was at the time attributed to a range of character defects, impatient and fickleness, said one contemporary, or laziness and indolence, as said another. <coughs> in any case, it was feared that his materials and techniques, quote, banished all hope for the future, unquote. Wunsch cites Watteau's contemporaries as tracing this decay to his excessive use of wheel grass, a linseed oil medium with cicatives added, as well as to a tendency to use impure other materials. So um, just to, I'll venture here and try to use this. So that detail is in that area of the painting, and I think you can readily see the cracks in the detail. The sum of his unacademic process unsurprisingly resulted in the cracking and discolor discoloring. Wunsch asked the following probing questions. Quote, how do we make historical sense of an artist who showed so little care for the durability of his paintings? In our own time, the idea of making an impermanent work of art hardly seems strange. But what might such an attitude have meant in the first half of the 18th century? What would it mean to think of Watteau as an ephemeral artist in his own time? Unquote. Wunsch argues that both a changing art market and an appetite for reproductions of paintings were key to Watteau's indifference to durable technique. He has thus given a coherent historical account and interpretation that assigns what was once seen as change to choice by the artist. This example of historical con contingency is further underlined by observing that while impermanence is a long-standing theme in Watteau's studies, it is only in the context of an art world that confronts impermanence in a myriad of ways that material impermanence as a choice is considered on equal footing with thematic impermanence in Watteau's studies. Wunsch trenchantly concludes his study by writing, quote, if the decaying surfaces of his paintings tell us something about his temperament, then they also reveal the consequences of broader historical conditions. They direct our attention to forces that restructure art's relation to time, and they remind us that the meaning of permanence is no more stable than history itself, unquote. The role of criticism in theory is also tightly linked to many movements in modern art not the least of which was abstract expressionism. One of the most inf influential texts at the time, published in 1952, is Harold Rosenberg's The American Action Painters. Early on in the essay, Rosenberg defines the action painters this way, quote, the painter no longer approached the easel with an image in his mind. He went up to it with a material in his hand to do something to that other piece of material in front of him. The image would be the result of this encounter, unquote. Materials interacting, active matter, was then the essence of this art, a perfect storm of chance, choice, and perhaps even in Rosenberg's world, um, sorry, chance, change, and perhaps even in Rosenberg's world, a touch of choice. Significantly, Rosenberg does not name any painters in his essay, but he was surely thinking of Jackson Pollock when he wrote of paintings acting in the arena. How then might chance, choice, and change be adjudicated in his works? Pollock was famously laconic, but he did occasionally write and speak about his materials and process and the necessity of them. In an interview, when asked about how he could control his paints with tools as diverse and unorthodox as hardened sticks, brushes, and tubes of paint, Pollock responded not only had he become comfortable with this technique, but he, he did not, quote, use the accident, because I deny the accident, unquote. It, a phrase, it is a phrase that can be read in more than one way. The first, of course, is a denial that there is anything like an accident. Such a reading fits comfortably in the surrealist tradition that influenced Pollock, allowing for the subconscious to also guide the creative mind. It also comfortably fits with Rosenberg's vision of the artist approaching the work with no image in mind. But a second reading is that Pollock denies the accident by making it something else, denying the accident a role by interpreting or working with it, actively redefining it on the canvas. Or even more subtly, observing an accident, a chance event, and retooling it to more explicit chosen events. Is there evidence for this, for these latter readings of the artist's statement? One number 31, unsurprisingly painted in 1950, is one of the icons in MoMA's collection. 
painted entirely of poor dripped enamel paint. We can see it hanging on the wall in a few of these photos of Pollock working uh, in his studio. Um, and it is in, in this area here. Um, it is not difficult to imagine the occasional drop of painting landing by chance on one number 31, and indeed this happened. You're looking at a detail uh, from the lower center of the painting where we see three pink drips, a color unique to these areas in this painting, but found in other works from the same time. Three pink drips. The vertical form of these drips <laughs> indicate they landed on the canvas as it hung on the wall. A little further up in the painting, <clears throat> and so just let me locate you again in the painting you are in this, roughly this area here. The vertical form of these strips indicate they landed on the canvas as it hung on the wall. I think you can see that. A little further up in the painting, we find a series of similar vertical drips, this time in a brown paint. These strips can, and I think should, be read differently. They march in regular pattern along a long pour of black paint, barely strained at all from the pre-existing mark. This suggests Pollock um, and again, just uh, slightly above where we were before. This suggests Pollock is editing that black pore with these brown drips, pushing it back into the web that you see in the overall on the left. And he's chosen to do so with a mark that is indistinguishable in material behavior from other chance marks. Whether the pre pink drips preceded the brown drips or not is immaterial here. What is key is that chance and choice can look much the same in material and material behavior. Now, I want to switch gears really rather dramatically here to quieter and distinctly more quotidian precincts than those we've occupied so far, those of conservators at the easel or bench. I do this to remind us as, of the conservator as actor, agent of change via choices, even if you see little of it in this brief narrative. What you will see is an effort to identify at least some sources of our critical thinking and knowledge, and thereby the context of any actions taken. Doing this puts me close to or even outside the nominal bounds of this symposium, Active Matter, but it stays in a very purposeful way within the bounds of this larger ambitious enterprise, Cultures of Conservation. A Brock, guitar, plate, fruit dish, pitcher, and music score is on my easel in the conservation studio at the Museum of Modern Art, removed from the frame to reveal the somewhat worn edges of the once new canvas upon which Brock painted. Art history tells me that its subject, composition, and palette are typical of Brock throughout much of his career, and that most certainly at the time of this work was done in 1925. Art and art history tell me that the paint has been applied with assurance, marked by the flat planes of color, edges reinforced occasionally to create a slightly greater sense of volume, even space, although it remains essentially cubist in style. Conservation experience tells me during my close examination of the work that very little restoration has previously been done to it. We call upon science during this close examination and use ultraviolet light to distinguish among the materials based on their differing fluorescence. I note a somewhat unusual pattern of fluorescence in a number of passages and <clears throat> document this information for later investigation and scientific analysis. I use infrared light to see beneath layers of paint to reveal lower layers and to search for evidence of any initial drawing of the composition. In this case, seeing very little such preparatory work or compositional changes, art and art history methods confirmed to me Brock worked assuredly and directly on the canvas. By the end of the examination, conservation experience leads me to conclude that the work, a recent gift to the museum from a private collection, has a layer or layers of dirt and grime on the surface. It lacks the crisp pictorial intelligence of Brock, indicating that it is in need of cleaning to remove the obscuring layers of dirt. A phrase such as crisp pictorial intelligence may arise from multiple sources. And so I make the decision to clean the painting of these accretions. As the cleaning progresses, the dialogue between disciplines continues. The practical problem, simply put, is how to remove the extraneous material without affecting the original paint. General conservation experience, as well as, as experience with and knowledge of other Brocks, tells me that the paint, with its rich appearance, is an oil paint. Science tells me that such a paint film over 80 years old is both well oxidized and therefore quite robust. With these facts and observations in mind, I choose a solvent, the ever available spit. 
This choice is also based, once again, upon craft experience, the result of myself and other restorers having cleaned many painted surface over, surfaces over the years with spit. The feel of the spit charge swab, developed over years of conservation experience as it picks up the dirt, is familiar. And slight drags or slips as it rolls across the surface alert me, tactily, to changes in the nature of the dirt or in the manner of the painting itself. But paradoxically, experience also tells me that experience can sometimes be an unreliable guide. So I undertake a series of tiny test cleanings on the various colors to be certain of my judgment of the materials and their susceptibility to my cleaning regimen. These tests, a kind of empirical science, indicate the picture is indeed safe to clean, and so the cleaning begins. As the swab lifts away the deep grayish grime, it yields a subtly richer and almost consistently glossy surface. The broadly glossy surface is quite at odds with the general art historical and conservation understanding of Brock's Cubist period. Cubist painting practice is broadly characterized by the frequent use of matte paints, paints that were further distinguished by occasional contrast with more glossy paints. Art history and conservation studies tell me that Brock, like other Cubist painters, rejected the traditional practice of applying a final saturating varnish to the painting. Yet in this work, we have a generally consistent sense of surface, one that is rich, hardly matte at all. My experience of having looked at numerous Brocks suggests there is something different about this painting from other Brocks dating after 1910. Finally released from the obscuring dirt and grime, and after the long, intimate contact that characters, uh, characterizes the cleaning, a few conclusions uh, came to my mind. The palette is, of course, more fully revealed. There are a mere half dozen colors, gray, black, green, ochre, white, and touches of red. The smoothness of the paint captures my attention. There is no sense of a brush, no fine threads of the brush hair pulling, pushing, and lifting the paint across the canvas. No rich impasto that one would expect from a paint of this thickness. Art history, coupled with recent conservation studies, tells us Brock and his cubist collaborator Picasso occasionally used the enamel paint Ripollin in some of these paintings, and that this may well be one of those, leaving one more open question about an artist's choices, about how things go in artist studios. Chance, choice, and change are agents that activate the matter of art in a myriad of ways. I've tried to look at these from a great distance and from outside the strict purview of conservation and conservation science, as a means of probing the permanence of any understanding of them we might have, as well as to reflect back to others, other questions and how we confront these questions in our own studios. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. We have time for a couple of questions, if we have any from the audience. You did say spit, did you not? You did say spit, did you not? I did. <laughs> it's not funny. It happens all the time. Okay. Uh, nitpicking question about the, the brock is, was it uniformly glossy? I mean, that would be very strange. I mean, at this point, you would often get you know, areas of gloss contrasted with matte areas. It's, it's, it's pretty glossy overall, Pepe. Um, not 100%, but... Um, I, I think fundamentally, uh, it's not relying on those kinds of contrasts the way you know, uh, somewhat earlier and rather more classic Cubist pictures. Whether that is a function of material or simply the way he painted, um, you know, these are the kinds of artist choices around material that is um, uh, one would invest in. I had a similar sort of question. So I thought you were going somewhere right at the end. Yeah. Were this is an authentic. Oh, no. <laughs> I didn't mean to imply that, but yeah. Um, yeah, no, that was actually what I wanted to know. What was your conclusion about the, the brock? I mean, uh, it's uh, probably uh, okay, but then the varnish is still a question. Um, uh, gee, um, connoisseurship. Uh, I, I would have no reason to question this, um, and I think that the more key question would be. Um, the provenance and the provenance on this picture is, is pretty much airtight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, since we're part, we have to talk about objects as well as paintings, and I'm thinking, uh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about this 
intentionality that we often find out by accident. And uh, recently, we're finding out in the, the West that many silver objects were actually intended to be black, that we have been taking the what we thought of as tarnished uh, off of. Whereas in Japan, in the use of alloys such as shakudo, there's been an understanding for a long time that many of these alloys are supposed to be black. And I'm just wondering, over the course of your career, how many times have you run into something that was originally thought not to be intentional and becomes intentional? Um, well, I, um, gee, uh, I, I guess what, what I would say is um, I'm terribly aware of the fact that what we know can be upset by the facts. Um, and I, just one particular example is Jackson Pollock's use of varnish or not. Um, he uh, once, uh, he, a picture of his number 71949 was shown at the Museum of Modern Art, I think it was in 1952. Um, it's a long, narrow, freeze like picture. Um, and he wrote to the curator of the show um, saying, that uh, he appreciated the show and so on, and that he would like to come into the museum one day um, uh, to put a coat of glue onto the painting to remove the draws from the corner. Now, we as conservators know that that's not the best way to remove draws. And by putting a coating on the surface, you um, irrevocably change it fundamentally. But it shows a real indifference on his part towards varnish. So it raises the question of, might he have varnished other pictures? And what would his uh, attitude have been? It's not the facts upset what we knew about Jackson Pollock, that the Cubists didn't, that the Impressionists didn't varnish, the Cubists didn't varnish, therefore the Abstract Expressionists didn't varnish. It's not that simple. Yeah. So Jim, I love the autoethnography. Um, <laughs> I wanted to- To your point from before, I hope. I wanted to ask you in particular about activity, yeah. not so much your definition of it, but as the autoethnographer of yourself, how important was the category of activity for you as a professional conservator? The, uh, you mean, why did I do this? You know, what provoked me, or? No, I mean, the, the cat was the category choice, change, oh. right? You had that. Uh, those were important for yeah. you. Yeah. Activity was not in that troika of categories. Was it an important category? Is it an important category? Or is it a kind of byproduct category? Oh, um, let me think about that. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think I need to understand the question a little more. I, I mean, we, we define ourselves by our actions. In the end, what we do is we restore. So it's almost like that is operating at a subconscious level, and you know, one restrains oneself rather than uh, provokes oneself. Um, but I, I, that, that, that's not getting at the subtlety or, nor the broadness of what I think you're asking. So let me think about it. I know there's lots more to talk about here. We've got a long panel discussion at the end of the conference. Thank you so much, Jim.